to the drums. We can all go with the beat, okay? And you'll probably hear some percussion coming in from the, I think the, the laser machine on that side. Super, guys, thank you for this opportunity. Yolanda, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Super. I'm going to tell you about a, something that I'm quite passionate about uh, is renewable energy. And uh, renewable energy mining is something that is extremely exciting. I come from the mining industry, and they will hesitate to admit to themselves that they are pretty short sighted and blinkered. If something takes longer than two months, or I'm sorry, two years, uh, to implement, it typically falls down off the table. So I'm going to introduce the Carbon Warm and the Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, the Carbon Warm is a Richard Branson, Mark Shuttleworth founded nonprofit in the United States, and we're about carbon reduction at the gigaton scale. We've got programs running in shipping, energy efficient shipping, in trucking, we've got programs running in aviation, trying to get aviation biofuels into air aircraft fuel tanks. We're involved in mobility. We're involved in helping governments, such as in Rwanda, get onto um, renewable power or off-grid solutions. But really, we're about helping mines make profit from installing renewable power. We've got global offices around the world, New York, Washington, we're based largely in Colorado, but we're in Beijing as well. Um, I've got the, the office in South Africa. We're about um, 150 staff full-time, 30 million budget, uh, largely from donations from the likes of the Bransons um, and the, the Shuttleworths and the, the Strive Must Viewers, uh, who are part of our, our donor funding group. As I was saying, we, we're involved in multiple operations, uh, not only in mining, we're in an interesting program in the Caribbean islands called the 10 Island Challenge, where we're getting 10 Caribbean islands off of fossil fuels onto renewable power. It's phenomenal. It's actually the 11 Island Challenge because we're actually now in the Seychelles as well. And um, we're, as I said, we're in, um, in shipping. We've come up with an energy efficiency grading system that people looking to use certain ships can opt to go for a more efficient ship or a less efficient ship and then they obviously are uh, penalized as far as that's concerned because we're trying to push shipping efficiency uh, up where, as I said, we're in aviation, we're in trucking, we're in multiple um, programs and the latest program is mine that I'm leading called Sunshine for Mines. And what we seek to do is to rapidly accelerate the penetration of cost effective renewables into mining. A huge target, 15% by 2025, with adopting mines implementing a 35% or more of their demand from renewable energy. I have a pretty easy task because the business case makes itself for renewables in mining. And I'm going to tell you a story about Goldfields and what we've done for Goldfields um, and how we've, uh, a process we have followed. But fundamentally, the business case makes sense off the bat. Mines are getting more high uh, energy intensive. There's more energy uh, security concerns in mines. In South Africa last year, we had Eskim gave us a bit of a wobbly around the, the March or May where they were containing the mines about 20% of their demand. Renewables are falling like you won't believe. I know there's some, there's some suppliers and some EBCs uh, sitting amongst you and they will tell you that the costs are falling dramatically. Fossil fuels are on the up. We have no idea where they're gonna be. And fundamentally, there's huge opportunities for shared value, social license to operate, upliftment opportunities with solar PV, and I'll get into that a bit more later in the talk. Um, another thing there's obviously sustainability um, requirements, corporate social responsibility, and renewables plays very well into shareholder demands. Shareholders are now looking for mines that are, that are sustainable, um, and follow sustainable development practices aside from the COP21 and the carbon, um, the, the carbon targets that have been set by the sustainable development goals. So I'm ready to move on here. So some of the barriers to renewables in mining 
have been a lack of information. A lot of the developers have been playing in the utility space. So they've been, for example, in the REIPP program in South Africa, or been involved in governmental um, development of renewables, but developers haven't understood mines. And there's this huge lack of demand, a, a lack of information from case studies. Of, um, renewables is pretty new, but it's even newer in the mining industry. Lack of demand pool. The mining um, C-suite um, managers you know, are only starting to understand this towards making their mines sustainable. And the message somehow doesn't get through down to the operational level. So we have this disconnect um, of a demand pool. A lot of concern about capital and risk. Um, you know, who, who's going to fund it? Who's got money to put uh, into renewables and mining? Um, lack of awareness around access to third party finance. And of course, there's a the complexity. Each mine, like each of us, is unique. We've got our own requirements and desires and expectations um, and different commodities that we play in. So we're all unique, just like the mines. So there's a lot of complexity that has to be unpacked. Our approach is to work directly with mining companies. So we're a, we're a non-profit organization which distinguishes us from the for-profit organizations, and we've got the bigger picture of carbon reduction in mind. Mines tend to love that, and that's quite a big benefit for us. So we partner with mining companies with the intention of finding optimized solutions. You can imagine your house at home, you can easily oversize a PV solution for your house, you can oversize storage, and that's why it's important to optimize these solutions, especially when you're talking about mining and then you're integrating diesel and possibly wind power or possibly a hybrid system. It's important that you get the right size um, for your requirement. We also are not biased towards anyone in the value chain. I gladly speak to um, international developers around the world trying to educate them on the requirements that mines have. I talk to developers, I talk to um, IPPs, and uh, we're about sharing information about and uh, helping the mines understand that this business case exists, as well as helping the developers understand what mine requirements are as opposed to utility requirements. So we work with a wider ecosystem, uh, with regulators, with banks, with international uh, you know, finance companies, local finance companies, etc. And the process is interesting. Um, when I was at Goldfields, we started out with undertaking an energy security planning process. And this is where most minds, I think, battle sometimes, is that this is where you start. You've got to understand what your energy security risks are. You can imagine at your house, if someone cut the wire from Eskom at your house, you would have grave concern, but you don't really mind if the power comes from Eskom's <coughs> nuclear or from coal power or from hydropower upstream. And hence, the importance of reverse engineering the energy chain back from the mine through the transmission grid, through Eskom in South Africa's case, through to either the uh, Kharib Dam or to any of the coal-fired power stations back to the energy resource and scrutinize each of those links in the chain for risk. And this is what we did at, uh, you know, for Gulf Coast. We did the energy security review and identified the South Deep Mine, uh, which I'll unpack a bit more, as the highest security risk, as well as the one that had the most potential for renewables integration. So what we then did is we did a techno-economic study, and we've got probably some of the best microgrid optimization uh, resources um, around the world. Um, we've been involved with. You know, in the Caribbean islands, they are like countries that have their own utilities um, and requirements. So we've, we've come a long way in using that in mining as well. Um, so what we do from a techno-economic point of view, and this may be the most interesting to you, is we unpack everything from the demand requirements of the mine to the Megaflex tariff structures to how often they've been curtailed by Eskom. I'm talking about the South African context. We're all over the world and we've got other case studies in Argentina and, and, and around the world as well. 
but fundamentally you've got to understand obviously the technical side of the mine, what their, what their ramp ups are going to be, what their current demands are, where they've spiked, um, what, what their, um, the Megaflex tariff is broken up into an energy portion and a demand portion, how much of the demand do they, um, have to, do, do they have to pay for and how can they reduce that. Uh, it looks at integrating storage, it looks at um, market grid optimization, on the technical side, and what we also do, we've got to look at the social, the social side. Minds of the future cannot afford to ignore social license to operate. And you know, when you do an environmental um, impact assessment, it's kind of like the last thing on their mind. And then, but that's what what nails them and protracts the project from happening for months or years, even. And so, the social side. Of renewables is an interesting side now because it offers mines the potential for social upliftment. I'll give you an example. There's 13 communities around the South Deep Mine that have about 50% unemployment. So thinking is then extend street lighting to those. And fundamentally, it's been proven that the murder rates reduce if there's street lighting because people are less willing to commit crimes in the dark. And when you bring them into the light, they're less likely to occur, as well as many other opportunities for solar and storage like community centers and industrial node developments. Um, so fundamentally, we, we went through a process where we got to an optimized solution for a mine, and then we took it to market for and behalf of Goldfields, and I'll tell you the story uh, in, in, in a bit, and engaged the market to understand what pricing they would come back with. Fundamentally, mines You've got to start with price. The rest is down the line. And if it's not cost effective, walk away. But I've got some awesome news for you. And then obviously our intent is to take it through to a PPA and eventually getting steel in the ground. So I'm going to unpack the Goldfields example um, for you. It's a, it's a fascinating example. Goldfields has got um, regions around the world, uh, mines in regions around the world in South Africa, Ghana, Australia, um, and in Peru. And as I mentioned to you, the South Deep Mine was the one identified as the one um, ready for renewables integration. An analysis of this particular mine resulted in an optimized solution of 14 megawatts of one side solar. So they've got a 75 megawatt peak demand. And 40, uh, 40 megawatts is, is about a penetration of, of 19 and 20 percent, uh, given that the sun shines during the day. And, and these are some of the, you know, the difficulties that you've got to deal with as far as solar is concerned. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how minds of the future really need to start thinking and stop cutting and pasting from previous minds, which, which has typically been the trend. Um, and fundamentally, what we also um, realized is that seven and a half megawatt hours of energy storage um, would be the optimal size for energy storage at Goldfields, South Deep Mine. And the primary reason for that was to offset the peak demand. We call it peak shaving. Secondary was to avoid the curtailment that we were having. We, Goldfields was being curtailed by up to 20%. Um, in May last year, that was when we were going through a lot of the load shedding. We'll all remember that very well. Another advantage of the carbon warming is that we've got Richard Branson's network of people and access to IPPs around the world. So we brought on 75 interested um, parties into the expression of interest. 28 of those were, uh, entered into the, the request for proposals process and we got 10 uh, compliant bids back. And uh, if you hear anything about what I'm going to say today, this is it. Renewables is cheaper than Eskom. That was what came back from the market. Significantly cheaper. Energy storage is cheaper than the round trip cost of diesel as well. I know there's some people who don't want to hear that here and who really, <laughs> that might be upsetting to them, but fundamentally, pricing has come back from the South African market. Admittedly, a lot of the players have been playing in the REI triple P space, but 
What has come back is that the cost is cheaper than Eskim. It's es at escalating less than CPI for the PPA duration of 20 years. That gives mines price certainty. Mines love price certainty. What price certainty? What do you think Eskim's next increase is going to be? 12,69, 9.4, and what's the next one going to be? We don't even know. <laughs> and this is the essence of my message, is that renewables in mining make sense. The business case makes sense. My biggest task in presenting at conferences around the world is convincing miners of this fact. So I don't want to talk too much about gold fields, but uh, it, it is an international company. We know the South African branch, but they are all over the world. And fundamentally, the essence of why gold fields was a pleasure is that the CEO and the top management believe and buy into sustainable development. They buy into shared value. They buy into social license to uplift around the world. And this is fundamentally where it's got to start. You've got to have a culture and a mentality for sustainable development. And the South Deep Mine has a 70 year life of mine. And who knows what's going to happen in five years or even 10 years time. So this is a summary of the process that we did follow. So any miners listening in, you've got to start with an energy security review. Understand where you're at risk in your energy supply chain. Then unpack your operations and understand what your energy, your uh, techno-economic optimized solution is. Then take that to market. And market typically tells you that you can get it cheaper. Gold fields will not have to lift a finger. The, the IPP, or the, the uh, independent power producer, will sort everything out from financing to installing, to, and they just pay rand per kilowatt hour. What a pleasure. A little bit of context um, for the South Deep Mine. It's the largest energy, uh, one of the largest energy consumers nationwide. Um, 300,000 tons of ore per year, 500 gigawatt hours of electricity. As I said, average of 55 megawatts, peaking at 75. It is grid connected, so this would be tied in behind the meter. Energy spend is one of the biggest costs of most mines, typically about 21%, but realistically it ranges from about 21 or 18 to 40% of a mine's energy spend is, uh, is, is a percentage of the operational cost. As I was saying to you, 12, 12, 6, 9, 9, 4, who knows where Eskim is going to be in the next year or the year after um, with what we've experienced. So the outcome, as I said, um, was the optimized solution we took to market and what's come back is what I said to you. It's cheaper than Eskim and diesel is cheaper than, um, uh, sorry, the uh, energy storage is cheaper than diesel. And solar is, is further reducing. This was a year ago. Already the prices have, uh, have come down significantly and dramatically. I was chatting to a colleague of mine, local pricing of panels is reduced to about 20% in, in the past year, it's probably even more. Um, I could, if I had more time, I'd have to share some of the case studies that we uh, are busy with in, in Argentina, and they're completely off-grid using diesel engines um, and looking to integrate solar, and the amount of diesel that they're saving, you're going to end up saving 100 million liters uh, of diesel over, over a 10-year operational phase. Starting to taper off towards the end of my presentation, these are some of the considerations that determine uh, uh, economic, uh, technical economic feasibility study. Those in red are having some of the high risk or some of the concerns that mines have had. Cost of storage is still high, but it is coming down. But just think about it. I mean, when storage is competitive and mines can start moving their nighttime loads and covering those with storage, as well as moving some of the nighttime operations into the daytime. Mines have fridge plants where they make ice. You can make twice as much during the day and use that to, to the night. Unfortunately, the mining industry is, 
It's got a stubbornness associated to it where they, they don't like to change things too quickly. But I'm in a little bit about minds of the future. Minds of the future are going to have to start thinking about how to integrate renewables and take advantage of the sun shining during the day. There's cases in, in Chile where the process plants are built up at 4,800 meters in the mountains. And had they built their plant at 3,000 meters and used the conveyor to, to um, recuperate energy, they would have made 12 megawatts of recoverable energy just by dropping the ore down the mountain to a lower level. So these are things that mines really need to start considering and how to integrate solar and storage um, to their current operations, um, how to start thinking about integrating the communities in minds of the future have communities as shareholders, not as stakeholders anymore. And this is a fundamental message that has to be driven through because communities are becoming one of the biggest stumbling blocks to mines being developed or mines flourishing. Case in point, in Chile, they've got huge anti-mining sentiments where the communities aren't letting mining happen because of the history of pillage and plunder. So another concern is financiers' risk. The banks have been all too happy to lend into the RAIPP because they are assured that ESKIM is going to be the final order taker and ESKIM is backed by government. There's a little bit of hesitance as far as funding from the banks are concerned for mines, albeit the <coughs> mines do or are perceived to have stronger balance sheets and stronger credit ratings. That can be debatable. And you know, mining exploration is, is, isn't really um, as prolific as it has been in the past. So there are all these concerns around um, finances and appetite for private PPAs. The yellow, the resource intermittency versus unpredictability. We've got weather maps that can almost predict what the weather's going to be like on certain days, and you can link that straight back to what solar production is. Um, betting on future uh, grid instabilities. Certain of the big mines had concerns with IFRS, the International Finance and uh, Reporting Standards as to whether this sits on your balance sheet as a debt or as an asset, and if it sits on your balance sheet as a debt, how much leverage do you have to raise uh, debt finance? And certain concern, it's not that much of an issue, because you can see it, you can describe it as a, as a service. I can unpack that with you in more detail if you do want. So getting towards just the summary of where we got to, uh, fundamentally, the, uh, how, how we've been dealing with, with the, uh, the lack of information is we are developing case studies for everyone in the Valley Train to tell you where these prices are coming in with the intention of developing a tool that mines can use to start assessing their own renewable potential for renewables penetration. Lack of demand pool, using gold fields as a case study. Uh, we're really hoping that uh, in the announcement of the gold fields of uh, the third is going to happen uh, relatively soon. And uh, whether we can get Richard Branson to be standing next to Nick Holland with jeans and t-shirt and floral bouquet. <laughs> Those of you that know, Nick is a great, great guy. Very, very um, frugal, prudent and smart. Capital and risk, again, establish standardized processes to help you as mining companies and developers understand how to get into this space. I mean, it is the way of the future. Complexity, simplify the complexities through standardization. So the next steps, we've got, uh, you know, we're leveraging more gold fields um, in the Peru mines as well as in Chile. Um, as I said, we we're working for a big Canadian um, mining company uh, in Argentina, uh, as well as many mines across, uh, across the, uh, the African continent and in Australia. Um, I speak at a lot of international conferences. Uh, the, we were recently on a webinar yesterday with the ICMM, uh, the International um, Council of Mining and, and, and Metals, which is the 20, 22 biggest gold miners are part of that membership. And they're all 
supporting and are supportive of sustainable development, especially renewables in mining, because not only is it cost effective, it has all the other benefits of carbon footprint, of greenhouse gas, of carbon credits, and mines of the future unfortunately have to start moving in this direction. Develop options for legacy sites. This is another interesting thing where cl mine sites are, are closed down and communities have developed around these mines. There's opportunity for solar to be put up on the tailing stands and continue supplying power to the communities as well as generating revenue for post closure. Megawatt hour storage is an interesting thing. We're all watching this space very closely. Um, as, as storage becomes more and more cost effective, we're going to see a big change in, in how mines start addressing this and how they start integrating storage into their, uh, into their operations, as well as starting to think proactively how they can start catering and posturing themselves better to cater to renewable energy. And that's everything from, from wind, solar, biomass, biogas. An interesting point that I didn't mention, solar and wind are typically static um, technologies, whereas the biomasses and the biogases have a lot more potential for social upliftment because there's agriculture involved in growing crops, there's logistics involved in transporting the material to the, um, to the plants. Um, unfortunately, it has its limitations as far as logistics uh, distances are concerned, but nevertheless, even when you do an optimized solution, cater for different technology options that assist with social upliftment as well, that have shared value opportunities, um, it's going to bode well in the future. So why work with Sunshine for Mines? Well, we bolster mines' internal capacity to identify renewables opportunities. We're building um, awareness around management at the C-suite level as well as at the operational level. We find optimized solutions, balanced demand, cost reliability, energy security, and community shared value. All that I've been speaking to you about. We don't sell any particular solution or system. We're a non-profit for change. We're about the bigger picture. That distinguishes us dramatically from the contractor model and the for-profit model. We have huge skills in organizing um, IPP, uh, sorry, um, um, procurement processes. We've got international databases that are significant. And as we, as we go on, we invite more and more um, of the international developers to, to, to contact us and get on our database so that we can offer a better value solution to the mines themselves. As I said, we've got huge experience and expertise um, through the Rocky Mountain Institute as well. Um, we've just parted with them, I should have mentioned this earlier up front, but the Rocky Mountain Institute is about getting the world off carbon by 2050. We've got scientists working around the clock trying to work out how to get the world off carbon uh, or fossil fuels by 2050. So I'm very privileged to be working for an organization that has the bigger picture in mind. You know, they're coming from the mining industry, pillaging and plundering the resources of the earth. And with that, I thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much.